There are over 100 bosses lurking within Elden Ring's massive open world, waiting patiently to slice, dice, crush, punch and smash you into a pile of dusty, tarnished bits. Every boss in the game poses a significant challenge, but some are so difficult you may find yourself considering taking up a completely different hobby, like knitting or calligraphy. Oh, what's that? You've just died to the hands of Godric again, so you're gonna go cross-stitch a fox for a bit instead? I do not blame you at all. Unable to progress past some of the game's earliest encounters, I was curious to find out which of the game's myriad enemies were the toughest. To find answers for this question, I sat down with Ollie, our guides editor, who has spent many hours battling his way through the game since launch. Thanks to his countless deaths at the hands of some truly horrible monsters, this is our list of the 12 hardest bosses in Elden Ring. Enjoy. So Ollie, I think it's probably fair to say that you have played a substantial amount more of Elden Ring than I have. How many hours have you put into this game at this point? Oh God, I don't know if I want that that number to be public. I, I have probably spent about 200 hours playing Elden Ring now, thereabouts. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. That basically does mean that you are now our foremost Elden Ring expert. We're going to start off at number 12 with a bit of a controversial entry, would you say? Yes, it's at least in my case, it's rather controversial. Melania, Blade of Mikula. It's it's probably going to be quite a surprise to a lot of people that I've put her in 12th place. <laughs> but there are 11 bosses that I found even harder than Melania. But Melania is considered to be the hardest among the Elden Ring community, is that right? That's what I've heard. I mean, not just the hardest in, in Elden Ring, but um, one of the hardest, if not the very hardest, in any From Software game. Yeah, that wasn't my experience. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I kind of unknowingly cheesed this boss fight, this amazing, magnificent boss fight. I had so much fun playing it, but mm. I used a... Uh, a fully upgraded mimic tier ash which ba if p people don't know what that does it summons a very very powerful clone of yourself with all of your current equipment everything at your disposal and it is basically like playing elden ring on easy mode and that extends to this fight as well i i had a, v a rather warped idea of this fight because i managed to beat her first time with the spirit ash's help on the video footage which will be in the background right now this Spirit Ash just absolutely thwomps her. <laughs> <laughs> there was a very nice moment when it, it felt like she was a pinball machine. It was it, like she was just bouncing between the two of our strikes. It was. It didn't feel great. Let's let's be honest. I, I'm sure it won't be that powerful for very long. I'm sure there's going to be a patch that's addressing it because everyone's talking about how powerful the mimic tier is. I mean, despite that, I could tell that she was incredibly powerful. If I didn't have the Mimic Tears help, then then I would be absolutely decimated by her attacks. I mean, she's... It, it felt more like a Sekiro boss fight than, than anything else in Elden Ring. She was very kind of <laughs> floaty and graceful with her attacks, and all of her attacks had lifesteal on them, so every time she would get past my guard she would heal up a bit it was uh, it was very nasty and she has these surprising flurry attacks that just come out of nowhere sometimes uh, and if you're caught with if you're hit multiple times by those attacks you're just dead and even if you're not she's healed way up over so many strikes towards you so oh god it must be a real test of patience you, you have to you've got very little window for error against Melania because she's just every time you you fail she gets stronger and more powerful and heals up she does very confidently wander around the edge of the arena and then she like rushes in doesn't she which yeah combined with a lifestyle not for me that's a <laughs> second phase as well that reminded me a lot of like platinum games bayonetta style when she turns into that flowery florence and the machine-esque <laughs> looking 
uh, version of herself, which also yeah. looked miserable. So again, in the footage, you make it look very easy because of that spirit ash. The main thing that I noticed about that that second phase, again, full disclosure, I only saw it once <laughs> because of the first time. <laughs> but um, when she turns into the the goddess of rot, the main thing is just you have to back the hell away from her when she does her giant area of effect scarlet rot attacks. Because mm. I mean, you do not want to be hit by scarlet rot and infected by that so that your health goes down as she heals up it's it's not a good time yeah it's a it's a great fight i had a, a huge amount of fun with this fight it looks enormous fun the arena looks really nice my only thing and i've made some notes before we started talking my only note for melania is that in the opening cutscene, it reveals that she has armor for each individual toe on her feet oh. which is extremely cursed she's effectively wearing those horrible running shoes that like have each individual toe exposed oh, no. but it's golden metal armor that's why she's so miserable so at number 11 we have elema of the briar i don't know whether i'm saying that right i don't know whether you're saying that right oh, that's all right then he's our first big lad on this list, and there's a lot of big lads on this list. I liked Almer a lot. He had a huge butter knife that he was spinning round and throwing at you. What was that about? Oh, that was nasty. That's that's his his main that's his party trick, his telekinetic sword. It's interesting actually because you fight against Elmer of the Briar several times over the course of the game, but he's only known as Elmer once if when you see him in the Shaded Castle in the Altus Plateau. Elsewhere if you fight him, he's known as the Bell Bearing Hunter, and he kind of crops up every now and then at, at various shacks at night. See, it's like there there are some bosses which only appear at night in Elden Ring at, at various mm -hmm. places, and the Bell Bearing Hunter is one of them. I'd go so far as to say that he is by far the nastiest boss that you can encounter at night purely because of his telekinetic sword, which usually when you're at kind of mid range, you're safe. That's your moment to, to breathe and heal. But that is exactly where he wants you to be because of that that flying sword with very awkward timings, which makes it very difficult to understand when to dodge, when to block. It doesn't help that he has he has a couple of attacks with the, the flying sword that look almost identical, but they have different timings. There's one that's like a three swipe and one with a four swipe. If you don't understand early on which one he's going for, you're going to get destroyed. You need to really study him and, and mm -hmm. pick up on his, his little tells and his, his wind-up animations in order to know what what is happening. At number 10, we have probably conceptually the boss that gives me the most existential fear. <laughs> it's Astel Stars of Darkness, a boss I can only describe as visually being like if HP Lovecraft had a nightmare about bubble tea. Oh, I love it. Yep, that's that's extremely accurate. He's just like an insect with loads of horrible little orbs on him. Those are not made of tapioca. They are... <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a quite a spectacle. This fight you can find Astel Stars of Darkness in. It is quite late on in the game in the consecrated snowfield, which itself is a completely optional area, so you might miss him entirely. Yeah, he is rough. He has a lot of very large area of effect magical attacks. The thing is, with huge bosses like this, the general mm -hmm. strategy is to stay under its feet because you're you're staying away from its claws and its mouth and you're able to to just wail away at it from behind. Yeah. But with all of these area of effect attacks happening directly below its feet, it's it, it tries as hard as it possibly can to stop you from doing that. So it forces you to kind of shake up your playstyle quite a bit. How do you even defeat it then? At the time I was using a skill an ash of war on my weapon called Raptor of the Mists, which allows me to kind of duck down and if I get hit in that time, then I spring back up and I take no damage. So sometimes I would use that if I, I saw that there was an attack coming and I just had no chance of, of getting out of the way in time. I would just proc Rapture of the Mists and um, and it would save me there. So I was, I was trying to stay under its feet regardless. It's just you have fewer windows of opportunity to deal damage, I think. We have Star Scourge Radan at number nine. Now, I've already said I love a big lad in a From Software game. Radan is a very big lad. He's a literal cannibal from the cutscene that I've seen, which is always an interesting and horrible thing for a boss to be. But he's redeemed somewhat by his tiny little horrible horse that he sits on that carries him around and is 
just horrible, just an awful horse. Now, I don't know whether you've seen this, but it's been revealed today. A Twitter user called Zully the Witch has been digging around in some of the NPC AI scripts, and apparently, Radan's AI is called Radan and Leonard, which means that his terrible little horse is called Leonard, which I absolutely love. I mean, if you're gonna call a horrible little horse a name, apologies to all <laughs> Leonards out there, but... <laughs> That's a perfect fit. Leonard, yeah. Radan and Leonard. So please do tell me about Star Scourge Radan, because he looks terrible. Oh, I mean, this was... I probably had put about 30 or 40 hours into Elden Ring by the time I reached Radan. And I'd, I'd heard about Radan because he's one of the, the rune bearers, one of the, the major five or so bosses that you're meant to hunt down and kill. So there was this... It was a very grandiose entrance to this this boss fight. Then I was spawned on the opposite end of a desert from him, and he was just firing at me with this gigantic magical great bow. And oh. I was, as as you head towards him, you have to summon all of these all of these allies because the whole thing is a festival designed to try and beat Radan. And all of these warriors that you've encountered before have come together to try and take him on. It mm. is just such a spectacle. It was it was magnificent. I had a a fantastic time fighting this guy. He is horrible, though. He is truly dreadful. He's big enough that his attacks just, they look bizarre. It's very hard to keep track of what he's doing. He likes to spin around an awful lot, and his movements, because he's on this tiny horse called Leonard, they're just very strangely arcing and floaty, and he, he'll move around in ways that you really don't expect. It took a lot of, of fighting against him and dying repeatedly in order to even understand what was happening. Particularly when he would suddenly disappear about halfway through the fight and suddenly reappear as a gigantic meteorite that, that strikes the ground and <laughs> obliterates all of my friends. But several times I thought I was doing well in this fight and then he would disappear and do that and I'd be on my own and realize that the only reason I'd survived for that long was because he had not focused on me yet. The trick for this one is to just make him aggro onto your mates and I can't believe I'm about to say this in, in all seriousness, make sure he doesn't turn into a giant meteorite. <laughs> Basically, I mean, when I, I, I think when I finally managed to defeat him, he was never even given the chance to turn into a meteorite. I don't really know what the difference was there. I think I just, I was aggressive enough and managed to avoid danger enough that I could be aggressive enough to just keep wailing away at him. Next, we have a boss that I personally hit because I spent an hour and a half over the weekend trying to defeat it and couldn't. We have Crucible Knights. I actually have not got that far in this fight that I realized it had a horrible second phase where it grows wings and a tail and just becomes even more aggressive and horrible. And this boss, I'm surprised it's so high up because it's right at the start. It's in Stormvale, right? Yep, yep, that's right. I mean, when I was making this list, I decided very deliberately not to just focus on the the objective toughest bosses in the game because they would obviously just end up being the final 12 bosses. Instead, I decided to focus on the the fights that I had the most difficulty with at the time. So mm -hmm. Crucible Knight is, is quite an early boss. You can encounter him in Limgrave. He was basically the, he, he's the early enemy who forces you to get good at the game before you continue on to anything else. That's how I see yeah. him. Very intimidating, lots of slow, deliberate, powerful attacks that he chains together so that you have very little time to strike back at him. You have maybe enough time for one, possibly two hits, depending on your weapon, before yeah. you have to block or dodge again. And once that tail appears in the second phase, your window for dealing damage becomes even smaller. He likes to, to bring that tail out during the moments that you would have spent attacking him. So you have to be very patient for this guy. I think I spent quite a bit more time trying to beat him than I did either Margit or Godric, the main bosses of that whole region. That's definitely a testament to uh, to his strength. The most important lesson that he teaches is when to heal, because I, I noticed this more fighting the Crucible Knight than any other enemy in the entire game. If you heal when you are too close to him, and too yep. close is quite far away. You have to be really far away in order to yep. heal safely against the Crucible Knight because the instant you press that input, he will change what he is doing. He will mm -hmm. go for his, I'm going to close the distance attack. He will punish you for it. If I was getting married and Crucible Knight was part of my family, he'd be at the wedding, but he'd be <laughs> at back table because I appreciate what he's done for me in my life, but I don't like him. At seven, we have Beast Clergyman, 
slash Malekith the Black Blade. Now this is another big lad, like we've already established. There's a lot of oh, these yes. in Elden Ring. He can pull the ground up to use against you. He throws loads of projectiles. He's got like a knife that's the size of a great sword, which is just horrific to watch that coming towards you. And then when you think he can't get any worse, he just turns into a massive wolf knight with an even bigger sword halfway through the fight. Yeah, this this one, oh, it was rough. It was very, very rough, as you'd expect, seeing as it's basically the third last boss in the game. We're going to get to the other two quite shortly. I, I was quite scared facing this this enemy because the, the beast clergyman, I recognized him. This is Garank. He is an NPC who you encounter in the Caled Wilds, and you have to feed him death root, which you get from killing lots of undead things. Yes. And uh, he will give you rewards such as incantations and ashes of war. There, there is a moment if you feed him, I think maybe four death root, then inexplicably Garank will turn hostile towards you. I had this moment back in the um, the bestial sanctum where he, he usually resides. Suddenly Garank was angry with me and I got a little taster ahead of time of how powerful the beast clergyman really is. I recognized him instantly when I got to the end of Crumbling Pharaoh Missoula and, and saw the nasty very quick beast clergyman with his massive greatsword knife. The thing about him is that he's almost the opposite of the Crucible Knight because instead of closing the distance, he will back off quite mm -hmm. quickly while striking at you. So if you're trying to be aggressive, he's not having it. He's going to punish you for it while backing off. What about when he turns into this wolf knight then? That was very, very scary. Ideally, you should use spirit ashes to distract him. I ended up using that that good old mimic tier again. It wasn't nearly as as obviously powerful here as it was against Melania. I mean, with Melania, yeah. I I basically could stun lock her. It didn't really work out that way with Malekith. Malekith just didn't really care. He has lots of very powerful, strange, ribbony area effect attacks, which will eviscerate you if you're in the vicinity when he attacks. So I, I spent most of that second phase keeping my distance and looking for the right moment to jump in with a single heavy attack and then backing off again, because I yep. I just didn't have a complete understanding of what he could do. Very in your face, very aggressive, very frightening. So it was it was quite, quite hard to face this boss. At six, we have Alec. Tool Black Knife Ringleader. So this seems very similar to quite a lot of other bosses in the game. Very fast, mm -hmm. very unpredictable, lots of leaping strikes. This also looked really difficult. Yeah, it surprised me how difficult this was. You can find Electo in the Moonlight Altar, which is a section of only the second region, Leonia, but it is a section that you have to go through quite a lot of the game and complete quite a lot of Rani's questline before you can access. So it's quite a high level area, really. Electo so for, given that it, it's she resides in a place that's filled with dragons that I had to fight in order to get to her, she was by far the toughest boss that I found there as the the leader of the Black Knife Assassins, which is a type of boss that I'd encountered several times before now. I thought I knew what I was getting into. And she, for the most part, she, she seemed very familiar. You know, her attacks mm. were very much like her, her assassin brethren, but she just hit harder. That was the main thing. She would hit harder and she had some attacks that unexpectedly reached me. <laughs> she has one area of effect attack, which is basically a one shot. I I had a very tough time against Electo. I had to face her many, many times. As always, persistence and patience and a lot of a lot of healing potions helped me to get through it. This is a trick that From Software plays quite a lot, which I really like, which is slightly remixing earlier bosses to almost prey on your expectations in a way that's it, it almost wants you to unlearn those very learned behaviors which is almost harder than just learning new behaviors if that makes sense yeah yeah i mean it's it's the same mechanic as as having a second phase to a boss fight i mean you spent so long yeah. learning all of these attack patterns and then a couple of new ones are thrown into the mix at five we have the full grown falling star beast which is a bull made from a meteor it's quite cute for a from software boss it has Pokemon energy, as much as bosses in this game can have Pokemon energy. It's got a furry little face, 
a massive purple eye, and a big furry ass. Why is this at number five? Well, let's just say you only find this enemy cute because you have not faced it dozens <laughs> of times trying to beat it. Funny story, actually. I put together this list and I knew that the full grown falling style beast was going to be on there. And I was sending yeah. you, I was, I was collating the footage to send to you, and I realized. I'd never actually beaten the full-grown Falling Star Beast. I'd left it oh. because it was too difficult, and I'd, I'd gone elsewhere, and I'd completely forgotten about it, so I had to quickly go and kill it at full level. So the footage that you're seeing right now, that is after I've completed the game, and it was still pretty hard to beat you this guy. You still die a few times in that footage. Oh yes, it was it was rough. The main thing is he has a lot of health. His weak spots are his furry areas, but it's very difficult to get close and stay close to him because he doesn't have much downtime. Again, you can maybe hit him once or twice during his his kind of recovery animation of an attack, and then he'll swipe at you with his his horns or, or whatever else. It was very rough. I, I spent a lot of time trying to beat him on horseback. I, I'd heard that a lot of people were having a, a, a decent time against him on horseback, so instead I opted to go on foot. It was kind of scary. You, you really get an idea of this thing's size when you're up close and personal without a without being on horseback, but it I did find it easy at the moment I switched away from horseback. That's not to say that it was easy. It was a very difficult fight. It stands to reason that the cutest boss in the game is the <laughs> <laughs> most challenging. Next we have Radigan of the Golden Order slash the Elden Beast. It's another transforming boss. So if we start with Radigan, he's got runes in him. So he's got a, a, an open chest cavity filled with glowing runes. He has like quite a comparatively small mace. Like his weapon is so much smaller compared to other bosses. Don't say that to his face. He can teleport which looks stupid. Oh, that was the worst thing about him. I should say, yeah. for those who don't know, Radigan and the Elden Beast, this is the final boss in the game. Is it? Oh, yes. Interesting, okay. As I understand it, this is Marika that you're facing. This is the goddess Marika. Ah. The goddess. <laughs> Radigan, I think, was Marika's consort, but they've kind of become one in a in a strange way. It's probably quite surprising that I haven't put him higher on the list. But again, I'm doing this in terms of how difficult I found it at the time. Yeah. And it was a very tough fight, but I was as leveled as I've ever been. And I, I came in with all guns blazing and a lot of determination as well, because I knew that it was the final boss. I think that's going to play a, a part in a lot of people's fights against him. He has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. He has the disappearing and reappearing, as you mentioned, with very little warning. He doesn't oh. do this at the very start, but again, it's it's like a, a second phase to just the Radigan phase, yeah, which forces you to mix things up, because for a melee user, that disappearing and reappearing is nasty. It, he does it at the moments when you need to attack him between his recovery attacks. He will just bring that out, avoiding damage entirely, and then punishing you severely with the reappearing, which does a little a little burst of AoE, which is just enough to stumble you and force you to stay still for his next attack, which is devastating. He can't be bled to shorten the fight. The only reason that I could get away from, from his mega damage area of effect attacks was because I had a, a very nice ability on my weapon called Bloodhound Step, which is it's basically just a, a long-range dodge, and it gives you a few invincibility frames to, to get away from certain things. I think without mm. that, I would have had such a hard time against Radigan. And by comparison, the Elden Beast afterwards was... I, I found him quite easy, to be honest. Considering he was the final thing you face, the Elden Beast was a lot easier to understand, probably just because of his his size and slowness. I found it just much easier to read what was happening than when I was facing Radigan. It's still very difficult because you have to beat Radigan first and then you have the Elden Beast to face. So it's, again, it's just a test of patience. It's mainly down to the Radigan phase that I, I put this boss at number four on the list. What I will say about Elden Beast is I think it's visually the best looking boss. So that does make sense why it is the final thing that you face. I love that it's yeah. clear, it's got a load of innards and its veins and guts look like a galaxy. And when you hit it, it makes the sound of glass and you're fighting it among all the earth trees as the sun sets in this kind of like bizarre astral plane. Just visually, I was just having a lovely time watching that. It was very soothing, very relaxing. <laughs> Absolutely stunning. They, they are very good at spectacle. 
in these boss fights, and I think they they really pulled it out of the bag with the the final boss fight. Going from beauty to absolute rancidness, we have the (laughs) Valiant Gargoyles at number three, which are horrible. Weird body shapes, they throw up poison. Awful. Not a fan at all. Yeah, this was the first proper brick wall that I hit in Elden Ring. I must have spent around three hours trying to beat the Valiant Gargoyles. The first half hour or so, I must have died 10, 12 times just against the one gargoyle, and then I realized that two of them show up. (laughs) That was just an absolute slap in the face. I I had to I had to get up and walk away after I realized that. I was just like, what what are you doing to me? These gargoyles are fast. They they look like they're they're quite slow because they lumber towards you and they take their time. But when they want to attack you, I mean, depending on the, the weapon that they're using, that's the other thing is that these gargoyles, they have different weapons and they each have two different weapons that they switch between at will. I think one of them has a, a giant axe and then a sword that they can bring out. And the other one has a twin blade and a massive hammer or mace that they can bring out. And that means that you have to learn and memorize four different attack patterns when you're facing these guys and it was just a lot it's it's very disorientating trying to keep both of them in sight at all times even yeah. with spirit ashes trying to distract one of them i i mean at this stage of the game my spirit ashes weren't powerful enough to distract it for long so a lot of the time i was just having to back off and watch these two <laughs> massive valiant gargoyles just stalking me. I was just thinking, when do I have a moment to attack either of these two? It was very, very punishing. I had less practice with the second gargoyle, so there were several times that I would I would finally, at long last, beat the first one. But the second one felt like a new a new enemy because I it appears later on in the fight, and I had far less practice with it, and it would come out with these amazing twin blade moves that would just eviscerate me. Yeah, it, it took a very long time to learn everything that these two had to offer. At number two, we have Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, slash Horalu Warrior? Horalu? Horalu? Yeah, let's go with Horalu. It's another large lad. It's the uh, last large lad on our list. He's got a big axe, and he's got weird timings, and his second phase is basically a Street Fighter character, and it even attacks like one as well. Oh yes, this guy was scary. He is the penultimate boss in the game, so you fight him just before you fight Radagon and the Elden Mm. Beast. And yeah, I actually found him even harder than I found Radagon. It it took me a little longer to face this guy and beat him than it did Radagon. I I loved this fight. I thought it was incredibly enjoyable, possibly the fight that I enjoyed the most in the entire game. Mm. It never felt unfair, is the thing. Godfrey, understandably, because they're related, he has a lot of the attack patterns of Godric the Grafted, who's the main boss of Limgrave. Ah. So again, it's that that trick that FromSoft like to pull where things are just a little familiar. So it gives you a bit of grounding so that you're not feeling completely lost when you face him. But at the same time, he is just dialed up to 11. His attacks are incredibly powerful. His combos are very aggressive. He can chain together attacks like the Crucible Knight can. So again, you have very little, very few windows of opportunity and you have to you have to do it just right in order to capitalize on them. He has a lot of health. He has giant combos and slam attacks which make him very dangerous in melee range. I'm sure for yeah. for ranged people and and spellcasters, you're going to have a very different list from me, but for someone who needs to get up close and personal, Godfrey was a nightmare. But again, he never felt unfair, which I really appreciated. He felt like a very worthy villain, a very worthy foe to face. And those are absolutely the best fights in the game, right? Where you, you feel like every mistake is yours. The main thing is Horror Lou. I mean, I, I loved the fight with Godfrey. Whenever Horror Lou came out in the second phase, I was just thinking, oh no. Oh god, it's horrible. Terrifying. He gets rid of his his giant axe and he's just barehanded going for all of these grab attacks that can basically one shot you if they if he gets you. There were several times that I'd finally beaten the Godfrey stage and then after the the mid fight cutscene I would just just be grabbed and immediately bodied by Horalu and killed in a single shot and given the amount of health that I had that is scary that that can happen. Yeah. I mean, he, he's very similar to Godfrey. He has a lot of the same attack patterns, but he's just 
he seems to be a little faster. And again, he just throws in these grab attacks that you're just completely unprepared for. Yeah, it was definitely a, a fight where the second phase was the tougher fight. And he's not even the last boss. So we've reached number one, and I'm fascinated now that I know some more context behind these other bosses. This is not the last boss of the game. We have Commander Nile, which by the way, considering the names of, you know, Godfrey the First Elden Lord, Radagon of the Golden Order, Elden Beast, Commander Nile is so <laughs> basic and generic and he just seems like a guy with a big spear and some lovely armor why is commander nile number one on your list well yes you are right commander i i, I say commander neil i don't know if that's right it could be commander nile <laughs> he you can find him in castle sol which is very high up in the mountaintops of the giants and he is completely optional utterly optional boss right but I genuinely found him by far the hardest in the entire game for when I found him. And wow. this is quite late on. I, I had a lot of a lot of equipment. I had some great armor. I had my endgame armor, in fact. I was tanky, I was strong, I had the help of my lone wolves, which had been fully leveled up, and I still spent hours hours trying to take on this boss it didn't help me that it's quite a long run back to this boss if you die so that was just adding to the frustration well that's less common in elden ring compared to other souls games right because in it most is. other souls games you have to do that run of death before you even get to the boss so i'm actually surprised that that's in here because normally they just put a a site of grace right outside the boss room or at least a statue of marika i mean that's why they added that that whole mechanic is to make it easier to get back to to big yeah. boss fights but again i think this is an, an optional guy, and you don't have to face him, and you're really not expecting much when you, you face him. And I don't know if I'm going to be alone in thinking that he is the toughest in the game, but I think the main difficulty that I found was his minions. He's, he, at the very beginning of the fight, he will spawn mm. two very powerful banished knights. And these guys are basically bosses in their own right. They are very tanky for a normal enemy. They can kill you in a couple of hits they are very aggressive <laughs> and just the thought of facing three of them at once it was enough that i i was dreading each fight against commander neil i found at last that heavy attacks against these banished knights was was very useful it would uh, interrupt their attacks some of their attacks but even after i realized that i could probably say two-thirds of my attempts against Commander Neil, I didn't even kill the two banished knights because they were just that powerful. They had, they gave wow. me such a hard time. I mean, it was kind of like facing these bosses that change into someone else halfway through. You know, you, you have to go through such hardship in order to get to the even greater threat, which is Commander Neil himself. When his two minions have died, he really comes out in full force. He has these huge whirlwind and lightning attacks. I think he has a lightning peg leg, which is <laughs> an interesting choice. But that thing is annoying as hell because it'll just stomp the ground and he'll hit you from a mile away, it feels like. He has such a long range and deals such huge damage. So a lot of the time, after working your way through these two banished knights, he would just kill you in one or two hits. It was a very, very rough time. I'm not surprised that an optional boss is at number one, because if there's one thing you realized quite early on with Elden Ring is that From Software had a lot of fun filling in everything around the edges of this open world. Yeah. And I think it makes sense that they've made these grand, beautiful spectacles out of the main critical path bosses, but people like Commander Neil, they've snuck them in of being a bit cheeky and being a bit like, yeah, okay, he is one that's bit more classic souls you've got to do the run to get there there's a couple of different enemy types in there you know this one feels almost purposefully difficult in a bit of a snarky grinning you're going to struggle with this and we want you to suffer kind of way whereas you were saying you know godfrey first elden lord was an incredibly fun fight very engaging very dynamic this just sounds like bullshit <laughs> yeah yeah it, it was hell i didn't get to the point where I was thinking I, I want to play something else but yeah. this is probably the closest that I came to that point <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Ollie, for letting me live vicariously through your experiences. <laughs> I can now no safely worries. put Elden Ring down and move on with my life playing games that don't make me feel inadequate as a human being. Yeah, thank you so much for jumping on the channel to talk to us about them all. Cool, thank you for having me.